Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Hannibal Part 9, Back Across the Apennines by History March. So, last time we saw Hannibal win another impressive victory against the Romans, despite the introduction of Fabius Maximus and his cautious new strategy. We're going to see the continuation of the Second Punic War in this video. If you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd ask you to please check out my Patreon. It's linked in the description down below, and it will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this video. Alright, back across the Apennine Mountains. Let's see what Hannibal does this time. And we start off with Hannibal's victory that I mentioned in the introduction. Despite Fabius Maximus's new strategy, a strategy that would come to be known the Fabian strategy, which was a lot more cautious in approach than the Romans had taken before, uh, he was going for more of a battle of attrition. Silently stalk Hannibal, don't engage in these major confrontations because Hannibal always wins them, try to weaken Hannibal over time. And this strategy was working, despite this, the Romans managed to get into a bad spot, or not necessarily into a bad spot, just a spot they didn't want to be in, and Hannibal managed a rather impressive escape. It's and I call it a bad spot, you might be saying, well, but the Romans kind of had Hannibal trapped. That's just how it is with Hannibal. <laughs> he can make anything into a good spot for him and a bad spot for his enemies. Late summer, 217 BC. As the fires across the Arga Falinus Valley died down after months of Carthaginian raiding, the locals returned to their burned towns and cities, struggling to bring their lives back to normal. Yeah. Having outwitted Fabius, Hannibal escaped the valley. And now, there was real fear in the Roman Senate as the Carthaginian general marched north towards Rome itself. Uh-oh. I mean, we talked about in a previous video why Hannibal didn't attack Rome when he had the chance. But will he do it now? The Romans don't know. I mean, they don't know what's going to happen. Hannibal's been marching up and down the Italian peninsula, winning victory after victory. Fabius has showed up and tried this new somewhat unpopular strategy, it hasn't worked. I mean, the Romans, uh, and in particular we're talking about the Roman elites, the senators, they don't know that Hannibal isn't going to march on Rome, besiege it, and defeat them in one almighty battle. Uh, there's a lot of fear th flowing through the Roman collective unconscious right now. And as a fan of our channel, you should definitely check out our friends over at Curiosity Stream, my personal favorite streaming service that features thousands of documentaries geared towards the lifelong quest to learn, explore, and understand. I've been subscribed to Curiosity Stream for over two years now, and I can highly recommend their history documentaries, which features topics from ancient, medieval, and more modern times. Our recommendation is Hannibal, a march on Rome, a fantastic, concise take on Hannibal's life and his struggle against the Roman Empire. You should definitely check it out. And you can watch it for free. As our subscribers, you get free access to the entire library of documentaries on Curiosity Stream. Click on the link in the description and register with the code HISTORYMARSH to get 30 days of free, unlimited access to thousands of documentaries on Curiosity Stream. And by registering, you'll also be supporting our channel. Great. I always like to let the ads play through, you know, since I'm reacting to their content. <laughs> Seems only respectful. Anyway, back to Hannibal. Escaping the Arga Falinus Valley with his army and plunder intact again highlighted Hannibal's genius. And as the Carthaginian army now marched north along the Volturnus River, fears in Rome were reignited that the attack on the city was imminent. But despite the road to Rome being open for the second time, Hannibal marshaled his army back into the Apennine Mountains. Yep. I mean, you know it's Hannibal when he's trying to make another mountain crossing. 
My goodness, we've seen several times cross over mountains, go through swamps. This man is really willing to brave the worst of conditions. And now, why doesn't he march on Rome? Well, once again, we did that other video um, on why he didn't take the opportunity the first time. The reasons might be the same this time. Now, we don't entirely know, and there's a lot of different opinions on it. Some people think that Hannibal absolutely should have marched on Rome, but, of course, he might be thinking about the broader war. You know, is it worth it to march on Rome? Will it change the outcome of the war overall? Can Carthage send the resources to support Hannibal? Or will the Romans be able to respond with overwhelming force? You know, there's a lot of questions and a lot of different opinions, and we talked about that in another episode. But, basically, Hannibal decides not to march on Rome and march back over the Apennines. His string of victories was not enough to secure alliances in Italy, and a Carthaginian general knew that without a firm foothold in the plains of Campania, he needed to establish winter quarters in a better strategic position. Right, and Campania, um, which we're seeing around here, this is where Hannibal uh, was in the previous episode. It's a very prosperous and rich Roman uh, territory, not territory in the official sense. It's just a rich and prosperous land. And there's a lot of Roman senators, elite Romans, who hold land in Campania. And this is one of the reasons why Hannibal marched his way down and started burning estates, because it was, you know, really getting to the Roman elites, those who were in charge. Um, but it may not be the most secure place to camp out for the winter, <laughs> you know? Heading back east to his old campaigning ground near the Adriatic coast was a prudent decision. Encumbered with plunder and herds of cattle, the Carthaginians moved slowly, cutting a swathe of destruction along their line of march, mm. ravaging farms and property, collecting provisions and prisoners as they moved, unopposed by Fabius. Yep, and this is part of the Fabian strategy that I talked about last time and I mentioned earlier in this video. We've seen this before, Hannibal marching around the Roman countryside, burning estates, taking crops, taking people prisoner. Part of Fabius' strategy is not to respond because he doesn't want to get into a pitched battle with Hannibal. He feels that he will lose a pitched battle with Hannibal. And so instead, he allows Hannibal to do whatever he wants and ideally, over time, through a war of attrition, you know, Hannibal is in enemy territory, he will start to run out of farms to burn and crops to loot, and his army will start to weaken due to their lack of supplies. Now, this is actually a pretty intelligent strategy, but you can see why it would be rather unpopular with the civilian population because their homes are being burned, their crops are being stolen, many of them are being taken prisoner. If we want to look at the Roman senators, many of their fancy estates are being burnt to the ground, and so they would rather Fabius take the battle right to Hannibal. Stop him right now. Stop him from burning all of our property. But that's not how Fabius operates, unless he has to, you know? I mean, Fabius uh, gets forced into positions he doesn't want to be in, as we saw last time. While this unchallenged destruction of Roman lands and the prior escape from the Aga Falinus Valley were the two latest embarrassing incidents that caused outrage against Fabius in the Senate, yep. it was in fact his strategy that preserved the Roman army from potential destruction. Right, there you go. Thanks to Fabius, the Republic stayed in the fight, which arguably kept their Italian allies from joining Hannibal. Yep, so they're showing the pros and cons. They're showing that back in Rome, Fabius' strategy was very unpopular um, for reasons I just described, but Fabius prevented what we've seen several times before, which is a Roman army being badly, badly defeated in a major battle with Hannibal. Fabius is, at the very least, keeping his army alive, and ideally, that will... Keep some faith with your allies. You know, if there's still a active Roman army in the field, hopefully your allies won't desert you. So, like I said, there's pros and cons, and I think Fabius knows what he's doing. I think we've seen that, and I think it is a pretty smart strategy, though one that has definite downsides, absolutely, and one that is quite unpopular. 
<laughs> Yet, due to his cautious war plans, Fabius's popularity in Rome was crumbling, and his allies in the Senate found it impossible to rally political support around him. Oh, man. It also didn't help that, by now, news spread throughout Rome that Fabius's property and lands were spared during Carthaginian raiding of the Arga Phalanus Valley, mm. which cast further doubts about him. Yeah. It's very suspicious. The Roman general tried in vain to improve his reputation by selling parts of his property to ransom Roman prisoners from Hannibal after hearing that the Senate would not fund their release. I mean, I respect that, you know. He's giving up some of his personal wealth. But it still doesn't look good to the Roman Senate. Oh, so Hannibal's marching around Campania, destroying all of our estates... Now, they care less about, say, the small holding farmers or the people who are actually being imprisoned. These senators worry about their land. You know, their lives currently are not at risk. They're back in Rome, and I'm sure they feel very threatened, but they are safe to a certain extent. But they don't want their fortune and property to be destroyed. And they look over at Fabius and, oh, that's interesting. His property's being left alone. You know, what's going on here? Uh, at the very most, it's quite suspicious, and at the very least, it's just frustrating. And to them, another point against old Fabius here. But despite the unabating criticism against him and demands for a more aggressive stance, he kept to the Fabian strategy, Respect. refusing to be drawn into a battle not of his choosing, and continued to shadow Hannibal. Sticking to his, his guns. His scorched earth policy had a very limited effect as many citizens refused to burn their towns and crops. But it did manage to hamper the movement of the Carthaginian army, which did not have a secure supply chain and had to live off the land. Right, and so animals marching around, stealing crops, burning farms. Uh, ideally, this strategy at its fullest extent, the Fabian strategy, we're talking about scorched earth. And we see this strategy used many times throughout history. You might think of, say, uh, the Russian army after Napoleon's invasion. It's where not only do you avoid engaging your enemy in a pitched battle, and you force them to scavenge the countryside for resources, uh, especially in a case like this where Hannibal doesn't have a strong supply line, but you ask your citizens to burn their own farms, their own property, so that when Hannibal reaches their farm, there's no crops to loot, there's no food to take. Uh, as they just mentioned, a lot of Roman citizens are refusing to do that. So that makes the strategy a little less effective. But even still, after marching around the countryside for long enough, you're still going to run low on supplies. Hannibal has a lot of men to keep fed. Meanwhile, Hannibal reached a place he deemed suitable for his winter quarters. The town of Geronium. Ah. Uh. It is unclear if Geronium was taken by force when Hannibal's terms were rejected, or if he took possession of the town after the inhabitants fled. Either way, Hannibal encamped just outside the town and had his troops repair the collapsed wall, as well as surround the town with a trench and a palisade, turning Geronium into a fortified granary for the Carthaginian army, where provisions and livestock were stored. The sick and wounded recovered in the camp as thousands fanned out to forage the fertile plain to the west, while others pastured the cattle and horses on the hillsides to the east. Of course, this is sort of uh, an interesting and somewhat amusing consequence of the Fabian strategy, is that Hannibal is settling down. <laughs> His men are going out foraging for food, pasturing the cattle, you know, they've become farmers now, <laughs> uh, as well as being soldiers. With enough provisions to last until spring, in a strong defensive position, with several roads offering multiple mountain crossings into Apulia, Geronium was the perfect place to winter with an army. Meanwhile, in the foothills across the valley, the Romans arrived some three days oh. later and began encamping. But the dissatisfaction in the Senate finally boiled over, oh, forcing no. Fabius to depart for Rome. Officially, he journeyed to the capital to observe religious duties. 
However, the more likely reason for his absence from the front line was to confront his critics and explain his actions. See, it's unfortunate because obviously you understand the uproar amongst the civilian population, right? I, I absolutely get it. But you just wish that you could tell, particularly these senators, like, hey, zoom out a little bit. Why don't you look at the bigger picture? I know you're mad uh, and probably frightened about your property being destroyed, but Fabius has a plan. Now, it hasn't necessarily shown um, results yet, but he was put into a bad position last time. But long term, this plan is a good one. One that can work if it is made to work. Uh, no plan is guaranteed to succeed, but this plan could go well. It's probably the best plan the Romans have had up until this point. But, of course, you can't just tell people that and expect them to go along with it. They still have the same critiques that they did before, the same objections. And so Fabius has to head back to Rome to explain himself and bolster support. In an effort to salvage any support he could for his campaign. While the political discussion raged on, back in the Roman camp near Geronium, Minutius assumed a more aggressive stance. Oh no. <laughs> As second in command, he was left in charge of the army with orders to follow the Fabian strategy. Uh huh. And do we think Minutius is going to do that? You know? And we can play a little game of Dora the Explorer here. Hey, everybody, do you think Minuchus is going to follow the Fabian strategy? And I'm pretending to hear y'all say, no, he isn't. <laughs> I don't think he is. I guess we'll see. And maybe he'll prove me wrong. You know, maybe I don't have enough faith in our boy Marcus Minuchus here. I don't know. But eager to put pressure on <laughs> Hannibal, he set up camp in the plain yep. from where he sent out parties of cavalry and velites to hunt down the Carthaginian foragers. Okay. Although most of the foragers escaped unharmed, Hannibal moved quickly to protect his foraging grounds by sending 2,000 Libyans to occupy the ridge overlooking the Roman camp. And you can already see how this is going to go wrong. Now, Minutius hasn't engaged in a pitched battle yet. He's already been more aggressive than Fabius would have been. But this is what we've seen several times before. You know, the Romans move in aggressively, Hannibal concocts some plan, and then manages to pull them into battle. This is what he's been so good at, is that Hannibal can bait the Romans. You know, lay out some trap for them, the Romans come right in, and then he surrounds them and defeats them in another impressive victory. Uh, this is one of the reasons that Fabius is so impressive, because... Generally, he's tried not to fall for those types of things. He's stayed back. He hasn't taken the bait that all of these other Roman generals tend to take. Now, I guess we'll see if Minucius falls into the same trap. I'm going to be honest, I don't have too much faith right now. And just to the south, he established a temporary camp where he stationed two-thirds of his army. <clears throat> Eager to square up against the enemy, Minucius yep. sent the heavy infantry towards the Carthaginian camp, while his light infantry and cavalry went for the ridge. This seemingly created a problem for Hannibal. Not only was he outnumbered, but he left his cavalry in the main camp. Whether he did this intentionally to appear weaker and trick the Romans into attacking, or because the horses needed resting, he now lacked the mobility needed for the clash against Minutius. Uh oh. With superior numbers. I mean, maybe Minutius is going to do what hasn't been done. He's going to win a victory. And mobility on their side. The Romans took the ridge. Wow. Seeing his chance to put more pressure on the Carthaginians, Minutius moved his camp to the top of the captured hill. Okay. I mean, that is a W for Minutius. <laughs> Uh, the Romans have not been seeing very many W's against Hannibal. Though I would say, stay cautious. But, of course, in that situation, are you going to stay cautious? He's just moved aggressively against Hannibal, and he's been rewarded for it. He's seen a victory, a rare Roman victory. If Minucius learns any lesson from that, he's probably going to learn the lesson, I need to stay aggressive. That could work, but... 
Hannibal's a dangerous, dangerous foe, and this is where he thrives. Oh. They're expecting another attack. Hannibal restricted all foraging operations, keeping the troops in a state of readiness within the forward camp. But Minucha stayed put, and after a few days of inaction, the Carthaginian general finally broke the stalemate by sending troops to forage in ever-increasing numbers each day, mm. until eventually some 4,000 men were committed. Dispersing so many troops in the surrounding countryside while already being outnumbered begs the question, did Hannibal so desperately need provisions for the winter and was forced to forage? Or did he want to weaken his position, perhaps even appear incompetent, to provoke Minucius into fighting and winning a few skirmishes with the aim of luring the Roman general into a trap once he became overconfident? I'm trying to wait for the statement to end. Now look, this is entirely speculation, right? Uh, we don't know what was going through anybody's head. I would probably guess that Hannibal was performing some sort of scheme. Judging from what we've seen before, he loves to do this sort of thing. Like I said, he likes to bait the enemy, appearing weak himself, and then when he draws the enemy in, when he draws the Romans in, he strikes. Now, it could absolutely be that he so desperately needed the food that he had no choice. I mean, either of these could be possibilities, but judging from Hannibal's track record so far, I would probably lean towards the idea that this was some sort of purposeful plan. Uh, and maybe there's some evidence suggesting that wasn't the case. I don't know. It seems like this is all pretty speculative. Whatever the case, Minucius answered in force. He led the heavy infantry against the Carthaginian camp while sending his cavalry and light infantry through the back gate to hunt down the foragers. The skirmish was a bloody affair, with the Romans getting the better of the engagement, killing many of Hannibal's foragers. Realizing it was time to regroup, Hannibal marched back to his main camp. Though I will say, to be fair, this at the moment probably looks like the most ground the Romans have gained against Hannibal throughout this entire campaign. I'm just remaining very cautious because, you know, this is part nine. <laughs> We've seen all of Hannibal's achievements. This is not a man to be underestimated. You know what I mean? So it's like, oh, the Romans are moving forward. They've won a skirmish. They've won another skirmish. Hey, be careful. I, I would always be worried that Hannibal has something up his sleeve. The exaggerated accounts of this victory caused widespread rejoicing in Rome. Senators and citizens alike believed that they finally had a oh, commander. No. Who could... I, I, and look, maybe this is going to go well for the Romans, but I just feel I can see it going wrong. You know, Minucius wins a couple of skirmishes that m maybe Hannibal was caught off guard. Maybe this is all part of his plan. But Minucius wins a couple of skirmishes. He gets over overconfident. He gets cocky. And then they get news of it back in Rome, and the Roman people, the Senate, say, Oh, well, Minucius is doing the job. What about you, Fabius? You've just been, you know, hiding this whole time. And look at Minucius. We put him in charge, and he instantly does his thing and wins battles against Hannibal. And I worry that all of this leads to another trap, another victory by Hannibal. ...can defeat Hannibal. Hailed for his success, a law was hastily passed that made Minucius co-dictator, oh, which was effectively wow. a return to having two senior magistrates in charge. Yeah, okay, wow. So, Fabius has been dictator, and this is why he's been able to keep up the Fabian strategy for so long, but even being dictator, you see, he's been forced back to Rome to basically defend himself. Uh, that shows you, one, how much uproar there was about the Fabian strategy, and two, something I, managed, uh, I mentioned in previous episodes, that the position of dictator uh, had some restrictions to it. You know, when we think of a dictator in modern times, we might think of the singular leader as all the power in the world. No, dictator was a position that was granted in the Roman world. And now, that position has also been granted to Minucius, which, of course decreases Fabius's influence even further. 
But things did not go smoothly. Fabius urged caution, while Minutius wanted to take aggressive action. Of course. Due to persistent arguments over strategy, Fabius proposed that they command the army on alternate days, yeah. or split the army into two independent commands. Minu yeah, this is sort of a famous little story. Minutius decided to take four legions and establish his own camp. Not necessarily a great way to command an army. And the Romans would have more issues with this, given that usually there are two consuls. Uh, having two executives can cause a lot of problems, especially if those executives disagree with each other. In this case, we have two dictators, and we're seeing the kind of problems it can cause. Oh, wow. Snap ending, by the way. Uh, we've led right into the Battle of Geronium, which we will be doing next time. Uh, we've built up. We've seen the victories of Minutius, though they are relatively small skirmishes. And who knows, perhaps this is all leading up to an impressive victory for Minutius. And he will push Hannibal out of Italy, but I think... Well, those of us who know the Second Punic War know that's not the case, but even if you don't, you can sort of see where this is going, you know? The Romans have tried this style of victory before, it has not gone well. I guess we'll see next time what exactly happens. Can Hannibal pull off another incredible victory? I'd be willing to bet on it, <laughs> given what he's done so far. So. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this video, once again, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon linked down below. Uh, please leave a like on the video if you liked it, and subscribe to the channel if you would like to stay updated on my future releases. Anyway, with all of that stuff out of the way, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.